Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, the invitation. I'm really excited about what I'm seeing here in FinTech Moldova. I'm Irish, similar small country, and FinTech has, has really helped us develop as an economy and, you know, allowed us to enter that new economy, whatever that may be, of digital going forward. So to kick on, why did a middle-aged, bald Irish man decide to go to a communist country that didn't speak the language and found a digital bank? And I, I can answer that in two ways. One, I've, I've always wanted to launch a bank at scale, but with an inclusion agenda. For me, digital banking or is, is one of the key ways of resolving the issues in society that unbanked individuals have to face. Predatory lending, inability to plan for the future for their children, for their families. And the second point, the reason was I'd made all the mistakes. I'd made so many mistakes. I've been a CEO, CRO, CTO, and I've made so many mistakes. I said, and I'd learned. So I said, now's the chance to do this. So I looked around. There was no point in founding a digital bank in England. There's so many digital banks in England. It's very hard to differentiate. It's a small population, lots of competition. So I looked around and kept looking around and talked to my mentors. And I found Vietnam. And Vietnam just blew, I wouldn't say blew my hair off, but definitely uh, got me excited. Vietnam is one of the most digitally obsessed nations in the world. On average, and I know this statistic now has gone up to about seven hours every day on digital media. Everybody lives on digital. But it's also the most, one, arguably the most unbanked in Southeast Asia. Um, it's a very young population. And in 2025, you know, 33% of its workforce is going to be Gen Z. I said, wow. And, uh, you know, like the rest of Asia, it, the success story, the GDP, the macros, the GNP. Um, and they're moving not just to be a servicing economy, they're a production economy now. And you can see that for young, the youth. Um, the rest of them you can read. I don't like PowerPoints, but I had to send one in, so forgive me. It's just more, you know, the key number I want you to look at here is $3,500. Because if you're going to build a digital bank, you should build it for profit. You don't want to build a Harry Potter digital bank. I'll grow and eventually I'll be profitable. But, and we're seeing that a lot of cases, people quote banks like Revolut, they don't make a profit. I'm sorry, I'm a businessman. I, w I need to make a profit to continue to serve. Okay? I can't go and beg funders continually in VC. And I think Chris saw that. We had a funding famine. Suddenly the music went off and everyone couldn't dance anymore. You have to build sustainable. So $3,500 means I've got to be able to serve a customer at a very low cost. Okay? No branches. You know, I can't, you know, a typical bank... Uh, would have a cost to serve. So that's a metric you have to always put on the front of every deck, which is how much at a unit basis, so your unit being customer, does it cost to serve a customer for one year? You see people like Nubank, one of the most amazing, what David and his team have done there are is totally amazing, you know, but one of the most powerful financial institutions in South America now and growing. They do a cost to serve per customer of $5 a month. I couldn't do that. I had to come up with a way of doing cost to serve of $5 a year. Why? Because cost to serve, on the other side, you have a ratio, which is how much profit do you make per customer, which is your lifetime value. So. We, for example, did a cost of acquisition in a market that's normally $20. If I pay $20 for a customer, I'm never going to make a profit. 
we, uh, in about 14 months, acquired 1.7 million customers at $2.93. Okay, and that took a lot of effort and a cost to serve. So the fundamentals were there. Okay, so this banking is a commodity now. There's no difference between a digital bank application, I'd say between one bank and another bank in most jurisdictions. So like all commodities, like water, oil, it becomes a price play. Everyone does deposits, everyone does current accounts. So you differentiate on price, it's no different than oil. And that price typically could be interest rate erosion or whatever. But in Vietnam, remember there were 60 odd million people with no bank account, living very happily, a very happy people, but they didn't have a bank account. And actually they didn't need a bank account. And you know, when we went out and did our research, you know, we saw the usual one, insufficient funds, minimum balance to have an account. You know, someone in the family has a bank account if we ever need it. You know, too far away. Vietnam is a very long country, well, very mountainous. You fly, you know, from the north, where I was in Hanoi to the south, Ho Chi Minh or Saigon, you have to fly. You know, driving will take you, I don't know, three, four days. Um, lack of necessary documentation. But... We can clear all of those traditional barriers. But I'm saying that's not going to make a blind bit of difference. I don't think I'm going to, I'm going to succeed if I just clear the traditional barriers. Because, you know, what I talk about a lot, and I get quite, I get quite frustrated when I hear bingo words like embedded banking, invisible banking, ecosystem. A lot of them are created by consultancy companies, and for some reason, I don't know, maybe they helped them do better PowerPoints. But let's look at what banking is. Banking's no different than any other service. So I think it's important you define an ecosystem. An ecosystem have been around since we crawled out of the slime X million years ago. An ecosystem, as Darwin, if we go back to what Chris was talking about, is about giving a species everything they need to survive and thrive. Okay? Some of you would have read Maslow and all of these types of behavioralists. But at the end of the day, no one in the history of mankind or womankind has said, I want a loan, full stop. It's, I want a loan to buy a house. I want a loan to educate my family. I want a, a financial product so I can retire. Okay? And I always build for the second part of the sentence because the first part of the sentence is product and products commoditized and I don't want to be there I don't want to be on a price play I want to be in a loyalty play I want to make a difference and a, a measurable difference which means you don't as I, as I say to a lot of people I can build the biggest bank in Moldova tomorrow no problem give me six months I can guarantee you it. zero doubt I could take out every single bank I just say, join my bank, I'll give everybody $20,000. Biggest bank in the world, biggest bank in Moldova. Give you a million dollars, just price, it doesn't matter. So it's about being able to address the actual human needs. Okay. So this got really, I had a really interesting first meeting with my funders. There was no venture capital. I had to go on a board of a couple of banks sell my beautiful good looks and amazing personality and knowledge. That didn't work, so I had to find a funder. So, the first hire was a psychologist. And my second hire was a sociologist. Now, in Northern Vietnam, and those of you who know Southeast Asia, people are very direct. So my funder was a family conglomerate. He said, Brian, why are you hiring a psychologist and a psychiatrist? Is this for you? I went, no, I'm pretty mentally okay at the moment, but thanks for asking. Maybe after this journey, when we launch this bank, I may need it. But in fact, it was trying to get to a point where we understood the needs of our customers. You know, beware of things like customer journey maps. Beware of digital factories. They produce digital pollution, different like every factory. 
what's important is we used to do day in the live map. We knew our customers got up in the morning, ordered coffee. Ooh, that's interesting. Took a taxi, went on their motorbike, watched video, <laughs> you know. So we actually started doing customer life maps, daily, weekly, monthly. And what were their views? We wanted to know what they really needed now to support their families and also to live better in the future. We developed something quite unusual. When you log on to TNX, we ask you how you feel. And why do you feel like this? Because in Asia, in Southeast Asia, the customer, you know, the customer financial index is low, okay? It's in the 20s, where Singapore would be 72 or whatever. I had to find a language, so I went down and I met the most, one of the most successful gaming companies in Asia. I said, would you, not gamification, that's trickery. I said, could you use these techniques for me to speak a language that my customers understand? Because I'm not going to talk to them about accrued interest future cost of cash. And I hate banks that go, learn our language. How dare you? That's wrong. Stop being so arrogant. So we spent about three months developing an emoji set. And, you know, the most scary emoji that was suggesting it should be my head, but we didn't do that, thank God. But we were trying to engender emotion. Remember, my customers, you see, they spend one hour, 15 minutes a day playing games. So they understood that language. But we had to find that language. Um, and at all times, be respectful. Just because you're poor doesn't mean you shouldn't have respect. Banking has an obligation to help society, not to live on net interest margin and high five. Okay? Not acceptable to me. So we ended up, some people call it embedded. I was talking about this embedded banking, what, 15, 20 years ago, everyone said, how can a bank make money out of pizza delivery? <laughs> that was called the usual strange. And that continues. It was actually quite interesting in the Vietnamese press. When I first announced I was going to launch the first digital only bank, they called me strange, misguided. But you know what? Unreasonable people changed the world. If you're in an innovation session and everybody agrees, don't do it. It's not innovation, okay? You have to have that, uh, that, that spice, okay? So what we did was, I said, banking is in the middle. Uh, to a lesser extent, you know, banking, our customers didn't want banking. They wanted to know how this bit in the middle would improve their second part of the sentence, their lives. So we deployed this... Um, for example, our customers could earn money. Okay, so we allowed our customers to earn money in a gig economy way by being our brand ambassadors, for example, by referring customers. Okay, so as you know, if referred customers or organic acquisition in that way is typically two to 300 times, 300% more active on a 12 week basis, and we'll get to that in a second, some of the metrics. We were the first to provide insurance because I got a phone call Brian, who was from a friend of mine in the police, he said, next week we're going to impose insurance for the first time in the history of motorbikes. And there are 66 million motorbikes in Vietnam. And that meant everyone was going to get fined. So we built the first digital straight through motorbike insurance for $2, and then everyone downloaded it and they went, thank you. Okay, so we were looking at the, um, and we did gadget insurance. In these economies, for example, people take uh, loans for, for an iPhone and pay it off over a year. As you saw, they were in between two and three thousand okay? dollars a year. So an iPhone, I don't know. I don't, I'm not really into mobile phones. I should be, but I'm not. But I know from buying it for my daughters, yeah, they're pretty expensive. Okay? We had step counters. We had banking. And banking, remember, banking's only three things. It doesn't matter if it's supply chain finance, I don't know, derivative trading, it's only made up of three things. Payments, deposits, so store of value and trust, and interchange and, and credit, the ability to empower people with the money they need to live a better life or run a better business. Um, what's interesting as well, we, we put our own chat channel inside. 
you know, better than WhatsApp, where people could create groups and communities and pay by message and do shared savings, etc. So um, what we were doing was, as you can see, and I'm just conscious of the time because I have a bit more to go, but as you can see, all of this circle on consumer, we were gathering data. So when I sat with my management team, I'm a 30-year banker, fine, banking's not difficult. Anyone who says it's difficult is, I don't know, is, is wrong. <laughs> At the end of the day, it's manage risk correctly, have the right skills. Very little innovation, hasn't changed. But I wanted to run the bank, and they're key metrics, but I wanted to run them on one particular metric, which was customer happiness. And they all thought I was insane, so I said to my data science guys, I want to know the customer happiness of every customer. Take every bit of data. When we did EKYC, um, we took facial expression, voice, to calculate. It's quite normal mood. And um, when we were looking at keywords on the channel, how were they feeling? We were looking at event patterning. We were looking at everything. Looking at health. How many steps do they walk? Are their friends happy? Are they chatting? Because what we were doing was we were teaching an ML model, um, mostly on linear regression, to actually figure out how happy our customers were. And eventually, and of course, then I'd have my marketing guys ring up the customer, are you sad today? And they'd go, why are you asking? Because we think you're sad. No, I'm actually happy. So we'd change the, we'd change the algorithm, we'd work from there, okay? The, we, we built actually two banks in nine months, guys, which is unheard of. Um, the second bank we built was from consumer, our customers shop not in big shops. They're, the backbone of the economy in Vietnam is micro SMEs. Very small. They, some of them don't even have a shop front. Um, where you can get everything from your watch fixed to a haircut to, to a, a great bowl of, bowl of soup, a bowl of foie gras or whatever. Um, and we knew that our customers wanted to be that. Now, these guys weren't digital. So we put forward an operating system that guys who have just a cart or sitting on the street could go digital. Um, and it really, really enabled our customers' lives because we also built a payments network. Because people can't afford MasterCard or Visa in these countries because there's margin give up. Because, of course, they need to be paid. So we built our own closed-loop payment system that terminated in, in QR. So we built our own QR so that people can accept. So in Vietnam, if you walk in, you want to pay for a card, they'll go, that be, that's 3% more, sir. And go, <laughs> there's cash. So we, we started removing those barriers. Um, and I can talk, just conscious of the time, there's so much there, guys, please catch me afterwards. I can walk you through many of these use cases. But I really want to get onto the kind of the, the lessons learned. Because you know, what I do now is I'm an investor, I'm chairman of a few FinTechs, I'm still starting FinTechs. But I also help many organizations build digital only banks across the world. We're currently helping about, uh, about four um, you know, digital only neo, typically neo rather than transformation, kind of greenfield stuff. Okay. Culture is the secret sauce. I'm sorry, it's, it's if you're going to take anything away. And it's not about agile and post-its on the wall. Agile is fragile in most organizations. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Anyone here? Hands. Who thinks agile works? Hands up. Please, someone's got to put a hand up for agile. Don't, let's not leave agile. Okay, no one thinks agile works. I don't think it works. I think it's an American construct. It works very well in America. But the variants are quite useful. Okay. You have to find a way of working. I remember, you know, Westerner in Vietnam. Now, I've worked all over the world, but Vietnam is truly different. It's not globalized. So we're going into Agile. I'm sitting there two weeks in. I'd, you know, I wanted to build this bank in nine months, both banks, the whole, you know, not just banks, but the platforms. And I called on my management team on a Saturday, and I went, guys, this isn't working. We've lots of post-its, no delivery. What's going on here? Lots of retrospectives saying we've done nothing. Oh, requirements to be, all the metrics saying it's not working. And we ended up developing a new way of working, which recognized the tribal nature of how Vietnamese want to work. It's quite interesting, and, and I don't know the culture of Moldova. I really hope to over the next one. By the way, I always like to be in as many countries, to visit the same number of countries as my age. 
So I'm 53. Moldova is my 54th country, so I'm really kind of happy. I'm one ahead of my age. I'm really, really. But creating a deliberate culture, guys. And a deliberate culture, I mean, I took, it's not business talk. It's about caring. It's about investing in people, treating them with respect, treating them the way you want to be treated, listening to them. Making sure the best idea wins, not the most senior guy, okay? In banking, it's command and control. That works for armies and old banking. It doesn't work in innovation, okay? So a lot of, a lot of the innovation we did, uh, we did 1,762 releases on Amazon in one year. Without a fail. <laughs> and with innovation. Because my staff weren't staff. They behaved like owners. They cared. We were making a difference. We took two million people out of being unbanked. We cared. Now, on the other ones, everything has to be data science driven, guys. If the data is in ETLs and ELTs and not moving, you're in trouble. Okay? You need to start looking at techniques like customer data platforms, CDPs, forget CRMs, that's after the fact, streaming, whatever. I'm a CTO, I'm a technologist. I'm not going to bore you, but I'll tell you right now technology is not the barrier anymore, it's democratized. You know, why? I did this in nine months. I built two banks when, which are now recognized in the top 100 globally, but in, they're considered to be the most, well, they won the best Gen Z bank in Southeast Asia. Okay, so it's not technology. It's innovation. It's people. It's caring. Security, fine. It has to be modular. Everyone talks about open banking. We'll get onto that in a second. Modular, event-driven, open source, API, low code. They're all just enablers, guys. Okay? <laughs> They're just tools. You have to get, you have to acquire a customer at low cost. Because if it costs you $5 to hire a customer, get a customer, you better be earning at least $6 or you're going to go bankrupt. Or go to VC and VC stopped. Um, we were carbon conscious. We were carbon neutral from day one. Why? Because that was important to me. And we did it. We're actually carbon conscious. Uh, we're actually carbon neutral for the next 100 years. Because we went down to the Mekong Valley, which is down the south, which are in a lot of pain, and we reforested you know, acres and acres. Because well, we don't own AWS, so we can't be uh, carbon negative, of course. We don't own the cloud. Okay. Operating models, guys. A, a digital bank has to have very few people, because it's digital. If you hear of an RPA project, you're in trouble. RPA is not digital, guys. RPA is business process automation, which involves people. You start working in workflows, which are highly automated, intelligently driven by data science. And that leads to a number which typically, currently Tnex and I left a few months ago for, for, to be back in Europe with my, with my family. Tnex works with 3 million customers, 172 employees, assets, liabilities, from business development to GL consolidation compliance. Or back to Chris's front, middle, and back office split. Okay. And as you scale in digital, your unit, your customer, in traditional business, cost income go up like this. We all know cost income ratios. In digital, as you scale, your cost goes down. So the cost to serve goes down if you correctly, and your cost, cost income is an old ratio. It's important, but it doesn't tell the truth. Okay. These are 20, I've got, I've been building digital guys since back in the Valley days when you could afford to live in the Valley and I've been failing and, and succeeding and failing and succeeding. So, you know, Teenex and, and what I do now is actually an amalgamation of all my mistakes and my learnings. And when I mentor people now, and I mentor fintechs around the world, I go, yeah, you shouldn't be doing that. Why? Because I did it, and it messed up. Okay? So, there's a few here. Let me pick a few. Bank should, a digital bank should never take more than 12 months to build. Why? Because the minute you build it, you're going to be changing it. And you're going to be changing it again. Okay? It's got to be cheap. So, you've got to introduce what's called frugality. 
Frugality, if you look at society, the best works of art in Moldova, the best works of art in Ireland, in the US, best books, best authors, be were always done at times of difficulty. Yep. Times of war, times of poverty. Because you didn't have money, you had to think. You had to innovate. Your grandparents had to innovate. My grandparents had to innovate. So you must run frugally. So in my case, you know, my guys would come in. Remember, talent, there's very little digital talent in the world. We're consuming it faster. So I had to train everyone from marketing to DevOps to, to compliance, okay? Now they learn more than me in the end, but I've been a, a jack of all trades and a master of few, okay? So you've got, they'd come into my office, Brian, we've got a great idea. I'm going, it's too expensive. Come. And nine out of 10 times, I want better and cheaper or, because I've got to protect my customer lifetime value, my cost line. Digital banking looks too much at income. You've got to look at cost and income, guys. Um, I'm picking one here. One I, that I think was intimated earlier. So I'm currently helping two digital banks, and they finally got it, that the minute you start building a digital bank, which should be cheap and quick, you start marketing. Because banking's changed. And this is my, before banking was just a set of products, yeah? Okay. Deposits, loans, payments, insurance, whatever, whatever, supply chain finance, derivatives, FX, FFX, whatever. And every app looked at that product layer, yeah? B open your app, balance, <laughs> okay? Now it's changed to customer experience. That's why BNPL works. That's why these terms embedding. How relevant can you be to the customer's life and how invisible can you be? Okay. Um, Uber was successful. If you ever read that use case in New York, they figured out because they made banking invisible. And then overnight, they became one of the largest payment receivers of payment in the US. Okay. So it's very much, very much around that path. Um, another thing you'll be very aware of, guys, the team that builds the bank, so I'm helping another bank, they're saying, well, we've got our project team and our run the bank team. There is no more run the bank, change the bank. I'm sorry, McKinsey, BCG, forget it, stop talking about that. It's now continuously change the bank. So how do you build a culture? That's why DevSecOps exists, guys. So you can continuously move at that speed. That's why you know all of these go faster, but they're tools because you've got to recognize that CTB, change the bank, or TB, they're old constructs. They're old keys. They do not open new doors. You're continuously changing, continuously innovating. Um, and it's such great fun, by the way. <laughs> leadership. Guys, leadership has to be embedded. I was spending, I didn't have a day off in four years. Fine, that's a problem for my family. I do apologize, but most of that was embedded with the team, just listening to their problems. Or sometimes I would actually tell them to do the wrong thing so they would be right. Because you had to build that confidence. These were young people. The average age of my staff was 24 years old. Obviously not me. But, um, you know, you had to build that confidence in that culture. You see, frugality. I can't. Do not spend money, guys. You, we, you, know, you should be building digital banks between 10 to 20 million, not 200, 300, 500 million, which I'm seeing in some jurisdictions. I mean, how can you even make that back? <laughs> Remember, there's no depreciation, all of you accountants out there. There's no capex in a digital bank. It's all opex. You don't get to hide behind seven years or whatever IFRS or GAP or whatever, IS, whatever you're using in Moldova. Five to seven years, you don't. No, no, everything's OPEX. You pay as you grow. You can't hide behind CAPEX. You don't go to the board and say, I want $10 million. You go, I'm going to grow into that using SaaS, modularization, platformification. Um, security. Mm. One that I'm seeing a lot now is feature frenzy. Now, I do believe in customer experience and product, of course, and, and product. But I see so many banks, it's not working. Let's build a new feature. No. Use data science. Figure out what is not working. If it's not working, get rid of it. Don't confuse your customer. Okay? And I see that even in the more mature digital banks. I suppose to finish up on my last 43 seconds, 42, 41 time, Chris, does exist for me, unfortunately. 
is one hour with your customer is worth a thousand hours with a consulting company or with a document, okay? Spend as much time trying to find out what customers need, really need. They don't need a loan. They need a, what the loan delivers. And if you can get at that, you're no longer a commodity. You can differentiate. You don't have to pay stupid cost of acquisition, cost of engagement. You don't have uh, cohort retention in the low percentages. You know, you start building a sustainable bank or a sustainable uh, financial proposition or a lifestyle partner. Done. Zero. Jeez. There you go. Uh, I believe you don't do questions here, so, but if anyone has any questions, you're more than welcome. I may not know the answer, but uh, um, I'm more than welcome. I'll be around for the next few hours. And once more, thank you so much, guys. I'm so excited to be in FinTech Moldova. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a place that I'm going to drive as much internationally as I can to bring some of the visibility that FinTech Moldova deserves. So thank you.